You're listening to Paso Chipotle, the show that will take you to discover the edible treasures of Mexico. Episode 17. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Paso Chipotle. The audible companion of Sabor, this is Mexican food, a digital magazine dedicated to exploring the markets, streets, recipes, and traditions that made Mexico an edible paradise. I'm your host, Rocío Carvajal, food historian, cook, and author. To find more information about this project, please go to pasdechipotle.com. Find the show on Twitter as Chipotle Podcast. Today with me is Sonia Martinez Garcia. Sonia is the proud daughter of Mexican immigrants who left Monterrey, Mexico, to settle in Houston, Texas. Northerners are famous for being no-nonsense, hard-working people, and certainly Sonia's family is proof of that. Like thousands of immigrant families who do whatever is necessary to provide children with a better future, Sonia's parents worked relentlessly to do so. Once in the U.S. and after working doing a number of jobs, Don Ramiro Méndez, Sonia's father, joined Casa Herrera in the 1960s, a pioneering business that became the largest manufacturer and designer of tortilla-making machinery in the U.S. Not too long after Mr. Méndez became independent, He opened his own business repairing and building custom-made tortilla-making machines, which pushed him into a new business venture, an all-Mexican family-run restaurant that became very popular in their community. And that's when Sonia's backstage career in the food industry began, when she eagerly helped her parents prepping salsas and helping in the kitchen during the first shift at 5 a.m. every weekend. From her parents, She learned how to prepare Mexican classics such as tamales, carnitas, and barbacoa. But more importantly, she experienced and learned one of the greatest virtues of Mexican people, to make everybody feel at home and fully channel the natural sense of warm hospitality. After a successful career as an entrepreneur selling specialty crafts and gourmet foods, Sonia was invited to collaborate with Que Rica Vida Network, a website that brings together traditional cooks. And later on, she joined the Hispanic Kitchen website as a resident cook, developing recipes. But finally, she decided to retrace her family's long culinary legacy, and in 2014, she started her own blog called Piña en la Cocina, which she still successfully runs. Amongst her many devoted fans, is the food service director of a prison, who recently shared with Sonia how much 1,500 inmates loved her recipe for tacos al pastor, and in his own words, made him and all grown men quiet and all about to cry. Because when most of the time prisons are about bad people and bad food, her recipes have brought hope and have helped bring good food and more importantly, satisfaction and good thoughts of home. Sonia is living proof that you have to always give your best in everything you do because you never know how far your work will go and how many lives it will touch. I hope you enjoy this episode. Sonia, welcome to the show. It's so nice to finally sit for a long-awaited conversation, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Rocio. I've been really looking forward to this interview. I can't wait. <laughs> Great, me, me either. 
Now, Sonia, there's so many things I want to to talk about. Um, I wanted to share with the audience so many details of your life. And how about we start from the beginning? Well, what it was like for you to grow up on the other side of a restaurant counter and see the slow and gradual takeover of Mexican food in Texas at a time when, well, and you will tell us, I think it wasn't quite yet fashionable to go uh, out and eat Mexican food. So how was that? Well, I know that um, in the beginning stages, um, I would say that there was competition, uh, but since we were a small business, um, I think it was hard. Uh, people would come in and they wouldn't really trust the food maybe, but once they tried it, it was very home style cooked food and and they loved it. We had a, a nice little following of people, but you know, having a restaurant, <laughs> the 24 hour job, it, it was just too much, too much at the time uh, for my parents to keep up with it. And so it was a few short years, but it was a very, very good learning experience. Um, for me being uh, a teenager at the time, um, I learned a lot. It was a great experience with my parents learning some of the food business. But, you know, Mexican food now, <laughs> there's no stopping it. There's no stopping it. And I, I'm amazed at how popular it is. I mean, people come to me sometimes and I have no idea they know about Mexican food. And they're asking me for dishes that I'm like, wow, I can't believe they know about that. <laughs> it's great. It's great that it's out there. It's popular. It's, it's number one, I'd have to say. No, that's absolutely fantastic. And I guess when you are like experiencing uh, the birth or the rise of, um, you know, a cultural trend, you don't really feel it. I mean, especially if you are so busy working and you were so young at the moment. So I don't know if you remember what was uh, your parents sort of reaction or, you know, reflection of of how Mexican food and, and really homemade traditional Mexican food was received back then? Well, it, I mean, we, in Texas, of course, you know, the food was received well. Um, um, I know that my mom um, on the side would make hundreds and hundreds of tamales uh, for people, neighbors, you know, um, and not just at Christmas time. You know, there's nothing like homestyle Mexican food and, and people search it out wherever they go and It's just one of those things that you, once you have it, uh, the restaurant food is just not quite the same. So I'm always searching for that perfect restaurant. But unfortunately, where I live, there is not much of authentic Mexican food. So that led me to my own kitchen eventually, you know, to try to recreate some of the dishes that, that I love so much. That, yes, <laughs> you went exactly where I was going, you read my mind. And, uh, yeah, I mean, there is something about uh, traditional food and also the way many societies, like Mexican, uh, transmit all this knowledge. So there is this art and craft of traditional food that is actually, like I want to say, a living, breathing cultural manifestation. And I remember on previous days before our interview that you shared with me how your mother's great cooking and knowledge would have just, you know, literally disappeared had it not been for the fact that you decided to start yes. documenting. Um, yeah, had it not been for you dedicating uh, all this effort in documenting all the great family recipes that she that she taught you, maybe not necessarily, you know, as in the right. form of lessons, but more like naturally, you know, the way it happens in a family or at least in a Mexican family. In our family, it was just natural for the family to help cook, you know, um, brothers, also my dad. It, it was just one of those things and since we were little and and we knew what good food was and if we wanted to eat good food we kind of learned to cook early on so <laughs> <laughs> i mean you come from a from a large family yes. and so everybody got involved all your siblings as well in the in the cooking at the restaurant yeah my brothers cooked on their own even if it was just a something simple, but they knew how to make chorizo con huevo and stuff like that, you know, we knew how to do that kind of stuff early on. And 
it was like we didn't wait for my parents to feed us it was <laughs> it was you know come into the kitchen and find what you want to eat and but of course you know mom's mom's meals were the best yeah well, i can imagine and uh I guess, you know, maybe because you grew up in this, you know, very foodie environment, uh, it sort of may have accelerated your interest in your own heritage or cultural heritage. You know, while living in Mexico, I usually see third generation immigrants who come back, you know, that sometimes or very often they don't even speak Spanish, but they, they, they mm. come back in, in search for retracing their family's history and heritage and wanting to know more about Mexico and Mexican culture. But in your case, you really didn't have to go back because your parents were recreating that for you. How was it that you decided to start uh, documenting that in the shape of a blog? It, I think it really started for me when I was asked to do cooking classes because, you know, before I would cook and there would be no recipes. I just knew what I liked. And I was trying to learn my mom's recipes and, you know, they were very basic, simple, but, um, you know, they were the traditional ones. But when I was asked to do the cooking classes, I was like, what? I need to have a recipe? <laughs> I was like, a recipe, a written recipe? I was like, oh, I can't do this because, you know, to me, I was throwing in a pinch of this, a pinch of that. Well, when I tried to translate it on a piece of paper, it was like way too much of this spice or that spice. And I realized that you didn't really need, you know, two teaspoons of salt. You needed, you know, a quarter teaspoon or whatever. And and so it was really hard in the beginning. The, the recipes were very long in the beginning because I had to explain every detail. And um, but then eventually I got the hang of it and um, doing the cooking classes um, led me to, you know, wanting to blog about it. I never owned a computer until 2011, as my family insisted, you need to get on online. Our, our family from Mexico's on there, they share pictures. And I was like, I don't want a computer. I don't care about being on the computer. And because I was working retail, and you know, I didn't have time to be on the computer. But but eventually, you know, that connection, I had to make that connection because especially since, you know, my parents weren't around anymore and I, I wanted to make that connection with my family in Mexico again. And, and so that led me to, you know, finding the food sites online. And I was just like, hey, and of course, everybody was like, please share your family recipes. I'm like, oh, this is where I need to be. <laughs> this is where I need to be. And, and I, eventually I saw other uh, food bloggers that were in the beginning stages as well. And, and they had the same, you know, stories to tell as I did. And I felt this is what I need to do. I want to tell my story. You know, I want to make that connection. And, and that's kind of how it started. I, that That's fascinating, because I guess something mm, most people uh, who have never been immigrants themselves, you know, one thing is to travel and spend some time abroad, but really being an immigrant and at least physically cutting the ties with your homeland, that is an entirely different story. Uh, it's beyond, you know, just the occasional nostalgia, but really the need, I suppose, you know, to, to feel that you belong to another community. It's funny how this situation or this condition sort of helps uh, blur, you know, blood ties and, and makes everybody from, from the same country a big family. Yes. Did your blog sort of prompt to, to create your own uh, digital family of sorts? Oh, yeah. Yes, it did. I, you know, in, like in the beginning, uh, and it happened fast when I uh, started sharing recipes on Hispanic Kitchen. You know, uh, soon after that, I was contacted by Carrica Vida and I saw this whole community of uh, Latina bloggers that I I was just like, wow, their dishes and their stories. And and I'm getting chills right now thinking about it because it was just very I was like, I can't believe all this has been happening. And I wasn't 
I wasn't part of it. And I met so many nice people. Um, um, of course, you know, Meli Martinez from Mexico, my kitchen. When I first stumbled upon her blog, I, I just couldn't stop staring at the pictures and reading the recipes because they were so familiar to me. They, I would say to my husband, Richard, all the time, that's the way my mom cooks. That's the way my mom cooks. And, and I just was like, wow. And I met other people. And I mean, the blogging has uh, given me the opportunity to travel and meet Melly and, and meet my friend Adriana Martin, who has Adriana's best recipes. You know, this is great. You get to meet people that have the same thing in common as you. And then I love hearing their stories. I, I I really, really enjoyed uh, Melly's interview and I told her I felt like I was there right there with her when she was talking about being in the kitchen. And I said, I remember those moments. I, I you know, you you connect with certain um, aromas or images and and um, that for me is like a big thing. So when I hear people describing, you know, the kitchen and the sounds and it's like I, I'm like right back in my grandmother's kitchen. You know, I, I, Richard laughs at me, but I said, you know, the cooking in Mexico is like ongoing all the time. There's only short breaks in between. I said, there's only short breaks and then it's back to the kitchen. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely true. And, and like you said very well, like when you, your own experience with your with your siblings is uh, th there's always someone coming in and out, but it's not really the act of just feeding oneself or feeding others, right. but it's, you know, uh, and and I don't want to sound cheesy because it's really not. It's it's really more complex. But it's a continuous act of of creating and feeding uh, yeah. that that keeps families. That is like the glue that keeps families together in Mexico. And it's that's something that I guess like you, I also uh, found it when I started a bit difficult to to translate or to explain um, to other cultures uh, the, the big role that me that Mexican uh, food plays for us. Uh, so it's really interesting to see how well how you realize how um, complex it was to translate not not in words but you know culturally translate and explain people uh, yeah. how how these how it works for, for, for Mexican families and how, well, like you said, how all these stories from all, all the fellow bloggers really started resonating with your own, no? And obviously, well, you have your own story, just like everybody else. And I was absolutely fascinated by, <laughs> I want to say one thing, but no, that all the things that influence your own work. So let's start with your dad and I know you were very close to your father and he played a really big influence in in your life not only in your work but you know in your whole life obviously and uh, he pushed you into doing uh, pursuing your project but he in his own right was also a pioneer just like you know, you are with your blogging and, and all this cultural effort that you're doing to share in Mexican um, gastronomy. He was a pioneer when he joined this huge uh, business w when he started working as a tortilla machine builder and technician. And obviously, you know, that was a really big stepping stone for Mexican food in general. And I think for me the Mexican community in America to sort of uh, claim their land there. <laughs> like we are, we are making our tortillas and we're making our food and we are sharing it with you as well. I want to know if you remember the, some of his stories or, or what it meant to him to be part of that. I just remember... Um being very young and he would talk about uh, the Casa Herrera, uh, which was, I think, was the, one of the groundbreakers in the whole tortilla manufacturing business. And he was very proud, you know, he was very proud no matter what he was doing, but he, especially about the, the tortillas, um, to think that he only went to school till the sixth grade, but he was building these commercial huge tortilla uh, machinery in his in his garage and and he would tell us in detail how he was building it what he had to do how it was going to come together 
how did he know that? I, I have no idea. I think about it now because before we were just like, oh, dad's just telling us a story. But now that I think about it and how excited he would get when he would find that one part he was missing to finish it, you know, and finally test it. And when people talk about corn tortillas and they say, oh, you know, I just buy them at the store and I get so disappointed because it's like, oh, it's not the same. <laughs> it's just not the same as having a real tortilla that was freshly ground and comes out of the machine warm. You know, it's it's just not the same. So I'm always in search of that perfect corn tortilla. You know, I I see a new product or because unfortunately I live in a place where you, you can't go and buy the ninsamal and all that stuff. So I have to try to adapt and try to create and try to do whatever I can to make it the best. But, you know, every now and then I'll get a tortilla and I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is just the way I remember. So do you or did your dad ever um keep any of the machinery uh, at home? He did. Well, the machinery he had, you know, he obviously was trying to sell it. That was his goal was to build it and sell it. But, uh, uh, you know, to this day, we uh, my sister who lives in California still has some of the, the stones that he would chisel down that would go into the machinery to grind the corn and I have one of the small ones here that that he used to use but you know he test he tested all kinds of uh, machinery for you know for tamales and for flour tortillas and for everything but you know so we look at that stone and we think wow all those times we used to make uh, day trips with him he would go to the tortillerias uh, another big one in california was uh, ramonas very very big um, factory food and we would spend hours waiting for him in the in his truck while he was in there working and and i remember my mom would pack us uh, you know tacos de chorizo or whatever and we would <laughs> spend the day there and that's what we did you know You think about it now, most kids don't hang out with their parents, you know, like that. They no. don't. And and gosh, you know, I'm thinking I'm so thankful that that we had those times because it wouldn't have been the same. Now we wouldn't have heard his stories. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I'm sure it must have been an uh, exciting moment. But, you know, all children draw inspiration from their parents and they move on and start doing their own things. Well, you had a long and a very successful uh, career in retail. And I don't know if, uh, what kind of knowledge and inspiration uh, did you draw from your past experience uh, to your blogging? Um, well, you when I worked in the retail, especially with the gourmet foods, you learned a lot. I guess uh, just kind of a styling food and what goes together, what doesn't go together. And yeah, I take from that a lot of um, from working in that uh, line of business on my blog. Now, I um, in a way, I always try to share the things that I know I like that I think go together because people are always like, well, how do you come up with the recipes? How do you I don't know. I just the way my mom cooked, she just threw things together and it just kind of came out as this delicious dish, you know, and, and that's why I always tell people, you know, if you're, if you're interested in, in your family recipes, then please take them now, write them down, record them, do whatever you have to do, because then later you're searching and searching and, you know, it, it could be the simplest thing, the simplest thing, whether to use freshly blended tomatoes to make a, a carne guisada or whether to use a can of tomato sauce. It's totally two different things. <laughs> and and I think you are just nailing something critical. I think there's two, you know, big approaches that can be taken to traditional food. So one is the effort that uh, researchers, you know, like academics make about, oh, let's find out a bit about this traditional food, and they go and interview people, and, and, and they... Uh, you know, try to learn as much from them in, you know, a number of sessions uh, working with them. Uh, but then the other side, you know, of uh, of those actual traditional cooks that never really think of documenting, I guess there's like this moment that both parts could benefit from each other, I guess. Like you say, you know, document it in the moment. Don't take it for granted. If you're feeling that passion and if you're feeling that interest, just 
document it because sometimes I guess some people say, well, who has enough sort of status to stop to talk about traditional food and right. have yeah no and and have this uh sort of credibility around you like w which are your credentials and then sometimes like traditional cooks feel intimidated by that like oh no no i'm just a traditional cook all these are just my family recipes but they don't realize they're sitting on gold literally right and right. <laughs> so like what you're saying effectively is that you are prompting people to jump and you know take ownership of yeah. of their heritage you know just like your fellow bloggers and also you know people who have inspired your work like Meli Martinez, uh, Leslie and Adriana Martin uh, well you know we know very well from Meli that it's pretty much uh, that same feeling it's just sort yeah. of take ownership of that and, and just right. go for it and I tell people all the time that you know we all have a different story um, you know Some of us had to adapt in different ways. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I know that uh, my family's uh, recipes were probably influenced by California and Texas, but that's okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah. We're still trying to hold on to the our heritage, but, you know, it takes us in different directions sometimes. But in the end, I think we just all come back to that simple recipe You know what I mean? It's just, there's nothing like it. I tell people all the time, don't overthink it. Don't yeah. just keep it simple. Yeah, yeah. You know, your path had to start somewhere. And in your case, obviously, it was about preserving your the memories of your family and the recipes helped you connect with new people, reconnect with your with your family. And what's ahead now? I mean, I know you you would like to start doing new things and you not necessarily Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to stop blogging, but then have you thought of going back to teaching? You know, what's next? Because I'm sure people will want more from you, you know, or to interact with you in a different way. So what are your plans ahead? I am interested in doing more one-on-one -on -one, uh, teaching. Um, there's some new things coming up <laughs> maybe next year that I'm looking into on doing one-on-one -on -one classes all through social media. <laughs> so um, it's something interesting coming mm -hmm. up. And I, 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 you know, it just kind of happened because of me being on social media and sharing, you know, uh, people see you. And sometimes I'm amazed at how many people actually see what you post because I get a lot of people contacting me mm -hmm. saying, oh, I saw you on Instagram. And, you know, uh, and so it's like, And I tell my husband, well, you know, you just got to put yourself out there because you just never know who you're going to connect with yes. and and share, share, just share. No, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, just going back to that same point, I guess you have a really privileged position now because, well, first you've been traveling and living in different parts of America. And also you have been back to Mexico, yeah. reconnecting and probably meeting for the first time some members of your of your family. I would like to You know, in your experience and in your opinion, do you think that uh, the increasing popularity of Mexican food has helped reshift, in a way, the Chicano, Cholo, Latino, Pocho identities? Yes, I mean, I, I'm amazed at how many um, men I see cooking. <laughs> um, when you talk about Chicano, mm. they are some amazing cooks out there, and they're very proud of what they're putting out and. I, I'm fascinated by it because I think, you know, uh, you know, they have this image of, you know, whatever Chicano and, uh, but they are putting the food out there and and they're very proud of it. And I think that people see the food differently, you know, because they see these guys that you think. Oh, you know, they don't look like they know how to cook, but then you see their plate. You know, I think that's great. I love to see, uh, I would say, I love to see men cooking. My husband doesn't cook. But <laughs> my cousins uh, in Mexico, when I went to visit in 2011, I was, you know, looking around. We had this big family reunion and a lot of the men were cooking. Oh. You know, and, I, and they're just very proud of it. And I, I think it's amazing. I think it's amazing. And 
And then they shared, they shared with me. So that was even better. So I was like, thank you. You know, I hear you have this image that it's just women cooking, but oh, oh no, no, no. It's like, it's amazing. I think it's great. And, and the image that they want to share that, you know, of the Mexican cooking, you know, it's people are like, wow. You know, there's just so much coming out right now, mm -hmm. and it's hard to keep up with everything that's coming out of Mexico right now. <laughs> well, that's that's great. It's empowering these voices and and these these skills that you know people even might oversee their own skills, no? And it's great that the family work, the family cooks together. You know what I mean? It's like the they cook together. It's great. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, well, it brings out the communal aspect of traditional food. Yes, you know? yes. For Mexicans. Food is really meaningful when it's shared. <laughs> Otherwise, it's not worth making it. <laughs> no, it's not. If you're not cooking for anybody, then what's the point? <laughs> I know. know what I mean? It's because you're putting you're putting yourself in that tamal right there. You know, you're just proud. And I always think that that came from my parents. You know, that he, my dad was always very proud of his. He would make us a simple taco, and he always wanted to know. You know, how was it? Did you like it? Yes, of course. You know, so. I think that's just part of us now. It is is part of the language of love, no food. Again, uh, I'm gonna jump a little bit uh, to another topic because, like I said, there's so many things I want to talk about with you. And you know, harvesting from all your uh, experience uh, in in your own path, I've been asked by many listeners uh, to give them some advice on, you know, like how to put together cooking classes. I don't know if you could share with the audience, like which challenges might people find when thinking about uh, setting up their own cooking classes. Uh, what should they avoid? What should they do? I, I don't know if you could share some of that. Sure. Um, the one major thing I would say is uh, writing the recipes out um, so that they're easy to follow. Not too many words. I learned I learned that the hard way, but <laughs> you have to make it simple. And, and of course, you know, when you're doing traditional dishes, sometimes the ingredients are not available. So you have to give people options, uh, variations on what they can use uh, in the recipes. Uh, but just, just try to keep it simple and get your, get your name out there. That's the thing. Get on social media and, and uh, share you know, uh, because people will seek you out. They'll see, you know, how passionate you are about what you're doing and how excited you are about it. Just keep it simple. So are you, are you currently still giving private classes in New York? Yeah, we do them occasionally. It's not on a regular basis uh, lately, but uh, now that I have a little bit more free time, it, it might be more regular now. So it's on request. Yes, yes. And that takes me to your website, which, you know, I mentioned in the beginning, uh, in your introduction is called La Piña en la Cocina and I keep on calling you Sonia and, and I know many of the listeners that are not familiar uh, with your blog and your work will be like what? Who is Piña and who is Sonia? And it is a lovely anecdote so if you could please share it with the audience. Yes, my, my dad always gave um, all his kids um, special nicknames when we were born and uh, So mine was La Piñita, which was little pineapple because people don't believe it when I tell them that when I was a toddler, I had very light colored hair and it would stand up because it was so thin and <laughs> <laughs> and they see me now and they're like, no way, you couldn't have, but I have pictures. <laughs> so my dad, my dad's name for me was La Piñita and all of my family in Mexico calls me Piñita or Piña. <laughs> And and everybody knows me as that. And so when I was trying to think of a name for the blog, I, you know, it had to be because I, I don't know, I felt that connection with my dad, you know, and it's like, I have to use that name somehow in the title. And it's, it just came, La Piña en la Cocina. It's like, yeah, because that's where I am all the time. <laughs> so it was great. And, and now people know it, you know, and it's great. No, it is. It is. And, you know, it can't be more personal and, and endearing than that. Yeah. Uh, certainly. And I know you are in a process of re-engineering your blog. So now that people will want to know more about your blog and about your recipes and all that, what can they expect in the new website? And, and when will you launch it? 
Well, I'm hoping that in it'll be ready in January. Um, it's just like I said, I, I just didn't have a lot of time to dedicate to it before. But now that I do, you know, I want it to be more user friendly, uh, easy to navigate, mm -hmm. um, things like that. Because I know, you know, when I first uh, started blogging, I was just so excited to get uh, uh, my recipes on there that I, I didn't really think about a lot of the things like special categories and things like that. But but now that I mm -hmm. see more people coming onto the blog searching for recipes, I I think it's really important to make it easier to navigate. And who knows who knows what it'll lead to, but <laughs> but I'm looking <laughs> forward to it. That's great. And um, something that I don't know if you have explored yet. Well, it's something that is quite big here in Europe. And I think in some parts in America is now beginning to gain popularity. It's called a supper club. And I don't know if you're familiar with that. I am familiar with it. Uh, I have a friend, Leticia, who lives near Dallas. And she does these underground dinners and oh my goodness I, I was uh, lucky enough to uh, to go to one of her dinners when I was there with Melly <laughs> and I just oh okay <laughs> she, was, she was talking about the different themes that she would do for these dinners and I mean some of them are very elaborate with music and the decorations and wherever they have it they may have it inside outside depending on what the occasion is but I asked her one of the questions I asked her was Leticia what do you do about people who you know have special requests like gluten free and this and that and <clears throat> they don't eat meat and she said to me, this is for people who love food and want to meet new people and, and be with people who also love food. So that was like, wow. <laughs> it's like, that's, that's, that's perfect. That's, that's the kind of environment I want to be in, to meet new people and talk about the food. And, and it was just a great experience meeting her. And uh, I'm looking forward to hopefully going back. And <laughs> yes, of course. But actually, I was going on the other direction of you <laughs> you doing it because I can totally see you. Of me doing it. Oh, I would love to do it. I, I, I just totally recommend it. That if, if someone in the audience is interested about knowing more of that, just go to my website, com, And there is a section there where I wrote a, a little piece about what supper clubs are. I think this format of supper clubs really can highlight the, one of the best qualities of Mexican food and, and, and Mexican uh, warm hospitality. So, uh, yes, absolutely. Yes, I do have a friend uh, who lives in uh, New York City and she's also a, a foodie, has a blog, and uh, she has been down a couple times and we've talked about doing that supper club so we're going to be getting together in uh, december to talk about doing the first one it's kind of exciting you know it's like it's like you think what menu to put together but you want to you want to make everything <laughs> you want to make everything but it's like okay you have to start simple that's what i tell myself just keep it simple don't overthink it and it'll be good no i'm sure it's gonna be great i will be uh eagerly waiting uh for that post on instagram about your upcoming supper club <laughs> Oh, Sonia. Uh, well, we've reached almost the end of the interview. There's still so many things I want to talk about. But uh, I wanted to ask a last question. And knowing that, well, since now you are a full-time blogger, where you know very well how uh, demanding it is. Now, now that you have all the time to blog, <laughs> you see what a full-time job it is, <laughs> no? <laughs> Right, and right. Uh, many people just romanticize the idea of, oh my God, it would be so nice to become a food blogger and just writing and cooking and all that. But once you do it seriously, like you are doing, like Melly is doing, like Leslie, like, you know, Nicola, like everybody else is doing it, it's really, you know, uh, you really have to commit to put out there something that is not only authentic and, and beautifully presented but also is professional right. you know yeah a lot of people do um, ask me about starting blogs and I tell them you have to commit to it though it's not just like oh I'm just gonna enter mm -hmm. something once a month uh, it's not quite that way I said if you really want to get out there it's a lot of work a lot of time and like you said, you want to keep it, uh, you want it to look professional. So I do a lot of research before I mm -hmm. try something new. Uh, if there's a recipe I've never tried but always wanted to try it, 
I research it and research it until I can't find anything else to <laughs> to read about it. And then and then I go from there. You know, you make your notes and and you start it and you try it. And I tell people all the time, if you want to try something, just try it. You have to try it the first time, baking mm -hmm. bolillos or whatever it is. You you're not going to know until yeah. you try. So and make notes for yourself on what you liked, what you didn't like. And, and then you move forward from there and the next time it'll be even better. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Perhaps uh, you could also start, you know, like uh, an easy to follow guide to food blogging about family recipes, which is an entirely different thing than just food blogging in general, you know, but uh, how to interview family members, you know. I mean, of course, I know that you harvest most of your inspiration from your colleagues uh, and also from uh, from your mm -hmm. own um, family recipes, but which are the experiences that inspire you parallel mm -hmm. to, to what you do in order to, you know, sort of refresh your approach? I wonder if you could share with, with the audience like which have been your favorite recent gastronomic reads and culinary experiences and, and discoveries that you have made uh, and that may have even obsessed you <laughs> as of late uh, to, to try new things? Um, well, the, the most recent, I would say, was when I traveled to Dallas again, bringing back Meli because I had never had the experience of cooking with another food blogger just to sit and see how she would think things out, how uh, she would work in her kitchen. You're just so used to being by yourself cooking all the time. You're not, it's true. You're not around a lot of people that cook. But, but to experience cooking with somebody else, I think that's a, a big thing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. My friend Sue, who owns a kitchen store where I do the cooking classes, I love Uh, to watch her teach, you mm -hmm. know, because it's just a different approach, how she talks to people, how she explains things. And, um, you know, she's always picking on me about that I'm a better cook. And I always tell her, you're a better teacher, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, just to experience cooking with other people, I think that's um, one of the things that everybody should do. And you shouldn't always just be so, um, well, this is the way I do things and that's the way it is. You know, it's like you're there to learn. I, I love to learn and I absorb information. You know, you're always learning. That's the thing. It's like never think that you're done learning because if you think that you're done, then there's nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm always learning. I always tell people, you know, I could make rice 20 million times and then the, the next time I make it, it's like, hey, I didn't know that. You know what I mean? There's always something to learn and you should always be open to it. And, you know, you nailed something critical. Uh, sometimes when you are, especially if you become like a solo entrepreneur, you know how much effort and how much hard work, heart, uh, blood, sweat and tears you put into your work. And, and, and that can work in your favor as in making you like you, you know, very self-aware uh, of your limitations and your progress. Uh, and knowing what your weak areas are and, and how to nourish um, your own process. But also, uh, you know, for some people might be like, will make them very jealous of their work and and not wanting to share or being afraid of, of uh, being judged or, or feel exposed. But I think it's really great uh, that you mentioned this uh as a as a good healthy practice that will keep mm. you humble <laughs> and will and will keep you know an attitude of open curiosity which is i think is crucial in every mm. learning mm. process and uh any books that you uh want to suggest to the audience like that you all have to read this because it's so great <laughs> my current uh cookbook that i love is uh nopalitos <laughs> <laughs> the same as nicole <laughs> yeah I love reading the stories, you know, that's the thing. Of course, the recipes are awesome, but the stories behind what inspires people to cook what they do, to do what they do. It, I relate to the food through experiences. So that, that's what it's about, you know, it's like sharing the experience with people and, and 
And I think that's what people like about my blog and how they connect to me is mm. is through the stories. Well, I often ask my guests what's special about their work or, or what makes it unique. It's more like a self-reflecting sort of question. And I have to say that always the answer comes as a very humbling response as to, well, you know, I do my best. My inspiration is from this and this and that, and, and it's not about me, and it's about the story, or it's about the food, or it's about this and that. So I think, uh, you know, they all coincide like you in, in, in being very humble. In the opening of the interview, as the listeners might remember, I shared this anecdote that Sonia very kindly shared with me about, about the cook of a, of a prison sharing how one of her recipes, and it was really not about the recipe, but, uh, how the taste of home made, at least for, for that occasion, that lunchtime for the inmates, a very, uh, emotional and, I guess, healing experience. And, uh, I don't know if there's another, story like what you said in the beginning you don't know who you are going to touch and who you're going to inspire with your work so you always have to put out your best uh, effort i learned from my parents no matter what you do you try to do the best job that you can absolutely absolutely so would you make us cry with another story please well there is one story that stands out to me all the time it's um a girl that sent me an email and I want to say this was like maybe six to eight months ago about how she was going to attempt to make my uh, conchas mm -hmm. that I had on my blog because um, her father-in-law was in the hospital with stage four cancer and now I'm going to cry <laughs> and that she wanted to recreate them and make them at home and take them to him so that he could enjoy um, homemade pan dulce the way that he mm. remembered it. So it was very, very touching. And like I said to you before, it's like some days I'm thinking, what am I doing? I don't know if I want to do this anymore. But then you you get emails like that and it's like, wow, it, you know, you're you're touching somebody, you're, you're bringing them a wonderful memory back uh, with food. You know, something simple as a concha you think what but to somebody else it could be a lifetime in a it bite. could be everything oh <laughs> yeah. yeah that's so nice so it's very special very special um those emails that i get did, did you send a follow-up no i didn't i i think that i responded to her but i never heard back so you know i try to respond to everybody everybody that emails me i i respond back and you know and i i just love it i i just love opening the emails and you know getting those you know, that they tried something and that their family loved it. And it's like, that's, that's the best. That's the best. Oh, that's a, well, probably something to consider for your next blog is to have a reader's uh, letters section. Yes, yes. As a navid blog reader myself, I enjoy really reading uh, stories like that. You know, and, uh, it, it sort of builds more into the the tissue of what we are all making together, you know? Yeah. Ah, thank you so much. <laughs> We've reached the end uh, of the interview. For now, I would really like to have you again, uh, Sonia, maybe uh, when your blog is, uh, your new blog is up and running. Uh, and, and First Supper Club. <laughs> the First Supper Club, yeah, let's make that a deal. How about that? Sounds great. That, that would be great. That would be... And, uh, well, would you please share with the listeners where can they find you in the interwebs, your social media accounts, email, Facebook, etc. Um, you can find me at La Piña La Cocina uh, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on my blog. Um, I'm there. And if you guys have any questions, please, please, please don't hesitate to ask them. I can find I can find the questions a lot faster if you send it to my Facebook page, La Piña La Cocina. Uh, sometimes okay. I I don't get to the email as as quickly as I'd like to, but uh, I usually respond uh, within 24 hours, so. <laughs> wow. It's like an emergency. Yeah. An emergency. <laughs> any culinary emergency. I'm this recipe right now, and I need to know, and I'm like, oh, no, don't send me an email because I may not open it for two days. <laughs> okay, well, let's ask the listeners to be patient then. Well, I'm going to set up all the links to your social media accounts and, and your Facebook 
uh, website, etc. So they can find them easily. There is going to be also a special blog post on my uh, website. Well, uh, muchísimas gracias. Sonia, thank you so much for sharing such a big, big slice uh, of your work and, and, and your life. Thank you. It was a great experience. Mm, it was delightful to have you on the show. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And audience, please stay tuned. We will return with the show after the break. <laughs> Day or night, the busy streets of Mexico's towns and cities are constantly busting with music, people, and the delicious smells that emanate from an unimaginable and amazing range of foods, snacks, and drinks. The fall issue of Sabor, This is Mexican Food, celebrates the world-famous Mexican street food and the cultural value of the nation's rich and ethnically diverse cooking traditions. With more than 16 emblematic recipes from the Grand Mexican Street Food Repertoire and five in-depth articles exploring the memorable stories of immigration and entrepreneurship, of family recipes and shared cultures to inspire you making a delicious cultural feast. To know more about the wonderful articles and recipes to bring the irresistible Mexican street food into your kitchen, go to pasdechipotle.com forward slash magazine. Take Sabor with you on all your digital devices. Go to pasdechipotle.com forward slash magazine and get ready to cook, learn and enjoy Mexican food like you never imagined. I want to thank you for being part of Positive Podla Podcast. You have made this show grow and reach hundreds of listeners around the world. From episode one and through more than 30 stories, this show has opened a window into the wonderful and little explored world of cultural connections, history and everyday life around Mexican gastronomy and traditions. Presenting the little and big events, that have shaped Mexico's culinary history. But more importantly, home cooks, farmers, writers and chefs, and all the people who have helped preserve and transmit this legacy. I want to thank each and every one of you for subscribing, downloading and making this show one of your sources of reference and enjoyment about Mexican culture and gastronomy. In the following days, I hope you enjoy the buzz and fuss of gatherings and feasts in Mexico, where a generous and heartwarming hospitality is part of our culture. We seldom bother about pomp and ceremony, but instead we focus on making sure to make our guests feel welcomed and at home wherever we are in the world. The Grand Mexican Celebrations bring together new and ancient traditions from the subtle and spiritual to the joyous and ludic, beautifully flowing from the intimate to the shared experiences, where the sense of community and belonging are always flexible enough to welcome and nurture locals and strangers in rewarding and soulful celebrations of life. Thank you for being part of this project, and thank you to my wonderful guests, Robert Nathan Allen and Javi and Viridiana Velarde, who champion gourmet insect-based products and edible insect farming. Deborah Tonner, who shared her fascinating insight about pulque drinking in Mexican history. Meli Martinez, for taking us back to her grandmother's kitchen and generously offered us a seat at her Mexican kitchen. Sean Harrell, for his dedication and care to introduce the northeast of England to proper traditional street tacos. Nicole Macrinos, for making sure people enjoy Mexican organic vanilla from the tropical rainforest in Mexico straight to your hands. And Sonia, for sharing her inspiring story crafted with love and a passion for family recipes. 2018 will bring many more delicious stories and the microphones of Paz de Chipotle will welcome the voices of Douglas Cullen, author of Mexican Food Journal, Carla Sasueta from Mexican Food Memories, Yolanda Ocon from Eat Latin London, 
Anaïs, author of The Curious Mexican, Nancy Lopez McHogg from Mexican Made Midless, and the amazing team of Mex Trade in Britain, and many more to come. But for now, let the fiestas begin. You can find all the links mentioned on today's interview on the description of the show, including the link to subscribe to my newsletter. On this episode blog post, you will find a delicious recipe to prepare a Mexican pork stew, a favorite of Sonia's family. Well, that's it for this week and this year. Thank you for listening and Feliz Navidad to you all. <laughs>